Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JS Box Crawl harmonizations. Today we're looking at O Mensch Bewein Dein Zun der Kloss, which translates to O Man, Weep Greatly for Your Sin. This is a very dense chorale and there's a lot going on, lots of modulations and chromatic intricacies in this chorale. We're going to try and get to the bottom of it. Let's hop into the analysis. So we have three flats in the key signature. We start on E flat major, we end on E flat major. I reckon the overall tonality of this chorale is E flat major. Uh, we start off on our one chord, like I said, and then we get uh, A flat, A flat, C, and E flat, which is our four chord, passing seventh in the bass. And then we get F, A flat, C, and F. I think this is a two chord here. Four going to two is a little bit of an interesting chord progression. Um, usually when we get chords that have similar functions like four and two next to one another, there's usually a buffer tone or maybe even a passing chord in between them uh, so that it sort of separates the two similar chords. And, and bare minimum, we usually get a single tone that serves, like I said, as a buffer between them. But I do think here this turns into uh, the key of C minor. Uh, this could continue to be analyzed in the key of E flat major. In fact, my first draft did have this analyzed all the way in the um, in the key of E flat all the way until we got to the cadence. But this sounds too much like a four seven one in the bass here in the key of C minor. After I've listened subsequently, so I do think that this F minor chord is also operating as four in the key of C minor. This B natural is also a little too interesting to um, ignore. C is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. And then we get B, G, D, and G, which is our five chord G major in first inversion. A little passing seventh here in the, t uh, the, sorry, the melody before we get the C minor again. C, G, C, and E flat. This D is a nine eight suspension over the bass. Um, very common to see nine eight suspensions over tonic triads. However, as we get to the resolution of this modulation of the key of C minor, I think Bach takes us right to the key of G minor, so already a lot of harmonic movement going on. We can see a similar thing going on here where we have the leading tone going to the tonic and the leading tone going to the tonic. So our first cadence is an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of G minor in a phrase that starts in E flat and takes us through G minor via C minor here. Um, C is a chord tone, D is a non-chord tone. That takes us to C C, E flat, and G, which is another four chord, no need to reanalyze there, passing seventh in the tenor. This time it's actually in the tenor. And then we have F sharp, A, E flat, and A. I reckon this E flat is a seven six suspension over the bass. It's very common for Bach to do this, where instead of doubling the third, we get the fifth somewhere, whether it be in the, the probably would be in the tenor in this case, because the melody isn't usually altered for harmonic purposes. Um, where Bach plays with the idea of the fully diminished seventh chord and the five seven chord in first inversion. They're very similar. They're only made different by this half step, as you can see here in the alto. But in this case, I'm inclined to believe that this is a five six five chord, and maybe that should this should be evidence that should influence my um, analyses moving forward. Because typically, we have a fully voiced seven seven chord here on this beat that turns into a five chord and actually now that i'm realizing it this isn't a five six five chord this would just be a five six chord because there is no seventh in this chord if we are regarding d as the root but the end of our phrase is fairly straightforward we go to g minor g g d and b flat tonic triad okay next phrase is also harmonically intricate from like a modulation perspective we end in the key of B flat with a perfect authentic cadence, but we go back to the key of E flat major, and then we visit C minor also sort of as like a like a surrogate, like a middle passage that takes us to the key of B flat, which is pretty interesting. So we start off on G minor again, uh, G, D, G, and B flat. No need to reanalyze in the key of G minor, but in the key of E flat minor, I reckon that's our three chord, and this three chord is. Uh, interesting because when we see three get used in Bach, we see it go to all sorts of different chords, but a lot of the times we see three go to four um, or chords that are adjacent to four or a third away from four. So like six, um, 
We don't really see 3 go to 2, actually. Sometimes we see 3 go to 2, 6, go to 3, 6 in that pattern that I've talked about in previous videos. Um, sometimes we see 3 go to 7 or 5, but the majority of the time we see 3, I'm going to hedge my bets and say the majority of the time, 3 go to 4. In this case, it happens to be going to 4, 6, that leap down in the bass, C, E flat, G, and A flat, and more specifically 4, 6, 5. And here we also have a passing tone, or sorry, a passing chord. There is a passing tone here in the bass with D. We also have B flat and we have F. All of them are non chord tones. And with that A flat, we have um, B flat 7 over D, which is 5, 6, 5. And it's very common to see this uh, adjacent harmony here, 4 going to 5, and then subsequently to 1. But sometimes we see that pattern extended with even more adjacent harmony with the three chord at the beginning of the passage and sometimes even more harmony before that but three four five is a somewhat normative progression um, in box vocabulary so we have e flat b flat f and g this e flat of course is the root of our chord and this is a tonic triad like i mentioned it's very common to see nine eight suspensions over tonic triads in root position especially and i do think however this uh, c minor here and apologies for the bracket going a little bit to the right here. It's going to take us to the key of C minor, where E flat is now our three chord. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that same pattern reiterated, uh, where we have a three, four, five progression in the key of E flat to a three, four, five progression in the key of C minor. We have A natural, C, E flat, and F, which is F7 over A. This isn't a secondary dominant. This is just melodic minor. As you can see, we have C melodic minor here in the bass, or C major here in the bass, uh, but context being the thing that separates the two, it's most likely C minor because we have the, uh, the E flat here in the uh, alto. But after our 4, 6, 5 chord, we have uh, B natural here, we have G here, we have D here, and we also have F, which spells out D. Uh, G7 over B, which is 5, 6, 5, and to finish that pattern, which is symmetrical to the uh, previous fragment of this same phrase, we have C minor, C, G, C, and E flat, tonic triad, root position. We also have some passing tones in the upper voices here, uh, D and F, which doesn't really give us a complete chord to analyze, but it is in passing regardless. It takes us to another C minor chord, C C, E flat, and G, which does need to be reanalyzed in the key of C minor, but in the key of B flat major, it's now our two chord. And the main reason why I think this is uh, moving to the key of B flat major is the cadence feels like we're moving towards a new tonic, and C minor is no longer our tonic. And we also have A natural going to B flat, which really feels like leading tone motion from uh, in the key of B flat. So there are some supporting factors to have moved us away from the key of moved us away from the key of uh, uh, C minor. We also have a neighboring seventh here in the uh, tenor. Before we go to F, C, E flat, and A natural, which in this case is our five seven chord, not our four seven chord like we saw earlier in the key of C minor. And then we go to B flat, B flat, D. Sorry, B flat again, D and B flat three roots one third two five one progression fairly standard and the last phrase of the a section is going to uh, be probably the most harmonically simple of the phrases in the a section we end in a perfect authentic cadence in the key of e flat and um, no modulations within so this b flat here i am going to call a common chord sorry that's not much of a bracket kind of more of like an s let me fix that so uh, b flat's now our five chord and um Conversely, you could analyze this as a direct modulation if this F minor feels counterpart to or um, kind of opposite to this F major chord. Uh, if you feel like this F minor really is starting a new idea that isn't linked to the previous phrase, you could just say that this is a direct modulation to the key of E flat major. But I'm just going to say that 5 is our common chord between the two keys, and then F minor is just a transitive harmonic progression. Um, F a flat, F, and C. And when I say transitive, I mean typically the motion of the chords takes us from the tonic to the tonic down the fifth or up the fourth rather than up the fourth or, uh, uh, sorry, up the fifth or down the fourth. So two typically goes to five like we saw in our cadence here. But 
5 going to 2 is transitive because if you're familiar with the transitive property um, in math, uh, it's the idea that if uh, a equals b, b equals a, if 2 can take us to 5, 5 can take us to 2. Um, but regardless, we have this passing tone in the bass, it's a passing 7th. We then get D, A flat, F, and B flat, which is our 5 chord in first inversion with the 7th, so 5, 6, 5. Um, B flat and it, it, B flat is a chord tone, G is a non chord tone, and interestingly enough, I am going to mark this chord as a G minor 7 with the B flat and the G along with this F. And no, actually, it's incomplete. I'm actually not going to mark it. I'm going to take that back. In my notes, I have it marked as a 3-6-5 chord, but because there's no D in the chord, I'm not going to mark it off of the harmonic rhythm, and that's just a stylistic thing that I do in my analysis. You could definitely analyze a 3 chord there if you felt so inclined to do so. But the reason why I felt like the 3 chord was, um, if, if bare minimum referenced here, it's because we have C, G, E flat and A flat, which is a 4-6-5 chord here, which is another kind of transitive harmony in a sense, because typically we expect 4 to go to 5, but here we see 5 going to 4. When they're in first inversion, it's not as um, interesting as when they're in root position, but regardless, that 3 chord sort, uh, sort of serves as a buffer in between the 2 chords um, going against the grain. The 3 chord starts this as like its own separate idea rather than the two chords sort of butting up against one another because like i said typically we would expect this chord to go uh to this one rather than vice versa but after our four six five chord we have b flat we have f d is a non-chord tone e flat is a non-chord tone and a flat is a non-chord tone it's almost like we have another passing five six five chord here um but with the e flat happening on the end of the beat and getting the majority of the beat's worth of stress, um, I'm not going to analyze it. The 4 6 5 chord is just going to take us to E flat major. E flat, E flat, B flat, and G, which is our tonic triad and root position. We also have a passing seventh in the bass. E flat's a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. And then uh, D's a little neighboring seventh here. That takes us to uh, A flat over C. C, E flat, E flat, and A flat which is our four chord and first inversion. Passing tone here in the bass, and B flat is also a non chord tone here. Um, and again, we don't really have an analyzable chord. It's sort of like a B flat sus, uh, B flat seven sus chord here with the E flat, but uh, it's not really how it's functioning here. Um, that takes us to A flat, C, E flat, and F. We know that Bach loves two, six, five chords, especially in cadential contexts. D is a non chord tone, uh, F is a chord tone, A flat is a chord tone, C is a chord tone. We do get a little bit of a root position chord just for a, uh, just for a little moment, but I'm not going to analyze it because it is so brief and doesn't really feel super impactful in the grand scheme of the harmony, uh, but you could analyze this as uh, the chord turning into root position and removing the, the seventh in favor of a, of a fifth. But afterwards we have B flat, F, D and F, which is our five chord, B flat major. B flat's a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. And that takes us to our tonic E flat major. E flat, G, B flat, and E flat. It's in root position to close out the phrase. Next phrase is a little interesting. We actually have a um, plagal cadence at the end of it, which is uh, pretty rare in the grand scheme of things. We're typically expecting to see authentic cadences and uh, half cadences that comprise the majority of the cadences that we see in box writing, but when we see a plagal cadence, it is uh, pretty interesting, usually speaking. And uh, maybe there's even a little hint of modality going on here at the end of the phrase. Uh, I'll let y'all decide on that because it's a bit of a toss-up as to whether there is or isn't. My, my hunch is that there isn't, but there's definitely an argument for the fact that there might be some modality at the end of this uh, phrase. So for starters, we start off with another E flat major chord. We don't need to reanalyze E flat, G, um, B flat, and E flat. And we have some passing tones here in the lower three voices with F, A, A, and E flat, kind of like a passing 2-7 chord, but it's not complete, so I'm not going to analyze it, but it's good to talk about. Then we have uh, G, B flat, G, and E flat. That's just taking our E minor chord and putting it in first inversion. So we'll just change the figured bass. 
and then we get a natural C, F, and E flat, which is F7 over A. That's a secondary dominant, 5, 6, 5 of 5, because F is the dominant of B flat, and B flat is our dominant in the key of E flat major. And that takes us to B flat, B flat, C, F, and D. Uh, this C is a 9 8 suspension, this C is a little counterpoint here, this B flat is our resolution, and this A flat is a passing 7th. But regardless, that's our 5 chord and root position, B flat major. And um, it's uh, more common to see 4 3 suspensions over root position um, dominant triads, but because our dominant's functioning like a tonic for these little beats here, um, it getting a 9 8 suspension is pretty interesting. Um, but after that, we get D flat, G. E flat and B flat, and here's an instance of our tonic operating as the dominant of four. In this case, it's five four two of four. E flat seven is the dominant of A flat, which is our subdominant in the key of E flat, and that takes us to E flat, A, a flat, E flat, and C, which is a four six four. Kind of interesting. The fact that it resolves. Um, oh no, sorry, not four six four. Apologies. This is C in the bass. C. A flat, E flat, and C. So four six. The fact that the four two chord resolves to the first inversion chord that we would expect it to is commonplace. And afterwards we get B flat. Uh, well, we have it's kind of a cluster actually. We have A, B flat, C, and D flats. Like a um, if you're playing it on the piano, then notes would be like right next to one another, which is kind of interesting. It's not really an analyzable chord, but the D flat still remains pertinent here, um, which makes me wonder, you know, it's like uh, how much A flat is lingering into this phrase. Uh, but regardless, uh, we have this passing B flat here in the bass as well. And uh, then we get A flat, A flat, E flat, and C, which is just taking our chord and putting it in first inversion. And then we cadence on E flat, which is our tonic, E flat, B flat, E flat, and G. Moving to the next phrase, we have a perfect authentic cadence in the key of B flat. No modulations, except for the one that takes us into the key of B flat. Um, and that's right at the beginning of the phrase. We have uh, C, C, G, and E flat, which is C minor in root position, which in the key of E flat is our sixth chord, but in the key of B flat, that's our two chord, and that's a passing seventh in the bass as well. We then have A natural, C, F, and E flat, which is another F7 chord in first inversion. That would be five, six, five. And also, we have some passing tones here in the lower voices with G, B, F, and E flat. That's not really an analyzable chord. Um, it's almost like a cl uh, cluster, like the one that we had here, contrapuntally speaking, but yeah, just counterpoint at this point. Um, we have F, A, F, and E flat, which is just taking our chord and putting it in root position, but there's no fifth on the chord, so the figured bass is not going to have a five in it. Then we have uh, B flat, B flat, F, and D, which is our tonic triad in root position. Some more uh, non-chord tones in the lower voices. We have D, um, F, A flat, or sorry, A natural, and C. It's almost like a passing minor seven chord in third inversion, but I don't really think it's making too much of an impact on the harmony, actually. It's kind of more incidental than anything else, so I'm just going to leave it out. Uh, and also the fact that the chord doesn't resolve the way that we would expect is kind of interesting as well. That wouldn't stop me under usual circumstances um, from putting it on the page. Like the fact that this was a 4-2 chord that didn't resolve to uh, 6 in first inversion, um, that, that, that wouldn't stop me. Uh, the fact that I think that it's just more of an incidental chord in the first place where we just have this passing tone here and the upper voices happen to be F and D. I just don't really feel like there's a chord progression happening here. This feels more like a neighboring seventh and this just feels like passing um, to get up to B flat major in first inversion. D, B flat, F, and B flat. Uh, but as the phrase closes out, we get a interesting chord here. We have C, we have B flat, we have G, and we have C. Um, it's kind of an interesting chord, however you spin it, because there's no E flat in the chord, and the E flat's a really integral tone to how 
um, the chord needs to be spelled in order to know the um, quality of the chord, because without an E-flat we don't know if it's minor or major, and I'm going to say that I just assume that this is going to be a minor 7 chord, but this also could be a 7, 6, 5 chord as well with the A natural being present, but without E flat we don't know the quality of the chord. Um, so we're just going to say this A natural is a passing tone and this is sort of like a false uh, suspension where it looks like a 7, 6 suspension in the bass, but the chord doesn't really resolve to something that is um, intuitively analyzable or um, straightforwardly analyzable. You have to use intuition. Um, to sort of uh, gauge what chord is happening here. Uh, G is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it in this case. Uh, but afterwards, we get F, we get A natural, we get F, C as well, with this passing seventh in the alto. That's our five chord, F major, and that takes us to B flat major. B flat, B flat, D, and B flat. Three roots and one third, just like the previous uh, B flat major ending as well. That's interesting. Um, afterwards, we get an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of C minor, but we're going to go there through the key of E flat major, kind of interestingly. And this D flat might be indicating A flat major, but it's actually just tonicizing the four chord like we saw in uh, or at the beginning of the of the B section. So we're going to say this B flat major chord in the key of E flat is our five chord. Takes us to E flat as well. E flat, B flat, E flat and G. Some passing tones in the upper voices as well before we get E flat, E flat, G, and B flat again. But with this passing uh, D flat here in the bass, I'm going to say that this is now functioning as 5 of 4. You might even say that it's functioning as 5, two, five 4, 2 of 4. But um, it really just depends. The D flat doesn't really create any consonant suspensions under anything besides the uh, the melody where it'd be like a what a 5 6 suspension uh, but afterwards it does resolve to uh, one, uh 4 6 uh, c e flat a flat and c so it resolves the way we would expect but i think that's uh, just by virtue of the fact that the d flat's just passing in the bass and that's just how the the motion tends to go in these sort of things but the d naturalizes on the next uh, beat or the next and the end of the same beat, and then we go back to our tonic in root position. And this isn't 6-4, I don't know why I wrote 6-4 there, I think I was just on autopilot and probably said 4 and was confusing the Roman numerals with the figured bass. But regardless, that takes us to our tonic. Something I don't feel like I've mentioned in a while is the fact that when we have a 4-6 chord going to 1 and there's this 6-7-1 motion in the bass, all except for one time I've encountered in the chorales um, there's always a passing leading tone that connects the two chords, always. Uh, sometimes there's a fully subdivided chord progression here with four going to seven or four going to five, but bare minimum there is a leading tone connecting the bass to the tonic when it's in this ascending fashion. Not always does four six go to one by stepwise motion like this, but when it does, this is the bare minimum thing that Bach includes, and there's only been one chorale where I've seen him break that rule or, you know, rule, his own personal rule, I suppose. I don't like thinking about theory in terms of uh, rules, but here we get some more chromaticism. This time it's sort of like a fully chromatic bass line where we have uh, stepwise motion from E flat to E natural to F. We have um, E natural, that must be a typo because we have E natural and E flat and uh, G and G. I'm just going to correct that real quick. Apologies about that. This got misprinted in my corral and I made it through my proofreading process. I am not a very good proofreader. It takes me a very long time. So apologies if little mistakes like these make it into the corrals. I'm generally pretty good at getting it or getting, you know, mistakes like that. But on longer corrals like these, it's uh, basically expected for one or two to get through. So may have E natural with D flat, G and... Um, I guess another G as well. It's like almost doubled here in the melody, but with the E natural and the D flat. Um, I think this D flat is um, kind of more, it's kind of more interesting than the C, even though the C makes more sense from an analytical perspective, because the D flat might be implying the fact that we're moving towards F minor, kind of hearkening back to what's happening here at the beginning of the chorale. 
uh, where we have the leading tones sort of connecting the bass here where we have E natural and F and then B natural and C sort of a fifth apart like they were here. Um, but uh, we're going to say the D flat is a 7 6 suspension over the bass because otherwise it would be an incomplete. Um, it would be an incomplete. Uh, like diminished seventh chord where we have the G but we're missing the B flat which is the important part of the diminished chord so we're going to say this is C E natural and G which would be 5 6 of 2 in the key of E flat major and that's going to take us to um, F minor which is our 2 chord F C G which is 9 8 suspension over our bass it's common to see that over chords that are being tonicized and this 2 chord is going to be F minor E flat could be a gateway to the key of F minor very uh, briefly if we did feel like there was a connection here. However, I don't feel like we have the same uh, sort of idea of modulation going on here with this um, D flat here, even though I'm kind of compelled now that there's a D flat there that maybe there is a modulation going on. Mm. Alternatively, yeah, 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 I'm going to walk it back. I'm going to say that now that I'm just trying to like audiate it in my head and try and figure it out. We're going to say in the key of F minor, this is our 7 chord. And then we're going to say that this is 5, 6. And then we're going to say that this is 1 F minor. So that's just flipping the analysis from the key of E flat major to F minor. And then we're going to go back to the key of C minor. Or um, I guess back to the key of C minor. We're going to continue our analysis as the way it would have been in this case to the key of C minor where we have F, C, F, and A flat operating as our four chord. E flat's a little neighboring seventh here. And then we have B natural, D, F, and A, which is our seven chord. Actually kind of brings into perspective the fact that maybe this is operating as a seven chord if these phrases are um, really sort of kindred spirit, or these fragments are sort of like a symmetrical to one another. Definitely not as symmetrical as these uh, phrases were at the beginning of the chorale, but there's definitely an homage to this first phrase going on here. We have uh, B natural, D, F, and A flat, which is our fully diminished seventh chord here. Um, F is a chord tone, and D is a chord tone, and then we cadence on one. So with that being the case, uh, now that arrow is going to confuse things because I sort of reserve those for... Um, things that are happening off of the beat. Maybe this is a fully diminished seventh chord in root position. It's hard to know for certain because it's incomplete and we saw some uh, incomplete uh, seven chords earlier as well. So maybe there is an argument there to be made that this is a seven chord, especially because of the fact that the D flat feels um, pertinent. It's the same sort of thing that was going on, where was it happening? With the five, six chord uh, here, where we had an incomplete 7 chord, where the 5th of the 7 chord was missing, but if you take a look at this 7-6 uh, suspension resolving down, we have a complete 5 chord. So similar things are happening here. There are some incomplete spellings that, from a semantic standpoint, make the analyses, like I mentioned earlier, not as straightforward. But regardless, uh, that was me analyzing in real time without having to reference my notes because there was a typo in the score. But interestingly, we're going to be moving from C minor to the key of A flat and then to the key of E flat for a half cadence in the key of E flat. But this D flat major chord after this C minor chord is pretty neat. We start off with C minor also operating as our three chord in the key of A flat major. And then we have D flat, A flat, F and F, which is our uh, four chord in root position three going to four, kind of like how we saw at the beginning of our second phrase in the A section. And four takes us to D flat, B flat, E flat, and G, which is uh, E flat seven over D flat, five, four, two. And we would expect that to resolve to our tonic triad in root position, uh, A flat major, uh, C, C, E flat, and A flat one, six. And with um, B flat happening here, B flat, D natural happening here, I think we've moved back to the key of E flat major by this point. And A flat major is operating as our four chord. Again, we then have B flat, D, F, and B flat, which is our five chord in root position, B flat major, passing seventh in the bass. And that takes us to seemingly our tonic 
if we look at these voices here with G, G, and B flat, you might be compelled to say that, but I think it's this E natural here that looks um, more interesting than anything else. I'm going to say this D is an accented known chord tone, and this is actually E diminished over G, which would be 7, 6 of 2. That could also be analyzed as a 3 chord, but we're going to say that this is 7, 6 of 2. Um, depending on whether you look at this G as the root or this E natural as the root, with E natural being, I guess, kind of the more interesting of the two tones, it makes me feel like it's operating as the, the root in here, especially because the chord resolves the way we would expect, uh, which is to a two chord. Um, F, F, C, and A, and this is actually probably the most interesting part of the chorale for me, because uh, we're going to say that this is a two chord, but two is um, if we look on the next beat we have a G B flat E flat and G which is our tonic triad and first inversion if you've watched my videos in the past you know that I have a bit of a strong stance I mean as strong of a stance as I have on like you know box writing in particular about two to one chord progressions sometimes they do pop up in the corrals and there's really no uh, you know questioning their legitimacy there they are there and they are two to one progressions but typically speaking if there is a two to one progression there's something happening behind the scenes and it's actually not a two to one progression because it's a relatively weak progression typically one gets approached from below so like five going to one or seven going to one um, and in this case what uh, I think is happening here is Bach is playing with the idea of two and seven coexisting and Bach does this all the time where two and seven are separated by a whole step right we have F F and A flat. This C would be the fifth of the F minor chord, but this D would be the root of the D diminished chord. And we've seen Bach tonicize seven in this way a couple of times in the past, and I don't think, at least this is my um, predisposition, uh, I don't think that um, one voice moving can constitute a whole chord progression. I don't think just a uh, Taking one voice and moving up at a whole, uh, moving it up a whole step constitutes its own separation of two uh, chords. I think that what's happening here is that when one voice moves and it happens to spell a new chord, when you take either of the notes, uh, that it morphs the chord. There's a difference between chordal morphing and a chord progression. And in this case, even though, you know, two is technically being tonicized here, I do think what's really being referenced is a 7-6 chord, and that this D is, it's quite possible that it is operating as the root of the chord. And in, um, you know, your harmony textbook will tell you that you can't tonicize seven. Um, and this is the closest that you're going to get to tonicizing seven, and that's by tonicizing two. Uh, or I guess you could tonicize uh, five as well, but tonicizing two is how Bach does it, and by that stepwise motion occurring, in this case in the alto, um, that's what's going to take us to one, because uh, uh, seven going to one is a much more normative progression by Bach's standards than two going to one, and to further, I guess, justify my logic earlier, seven, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, it's... Uh, much it's it's much more common of a chord progression from seven to go to one i was going to say something else but i lost my train of thought maybe it'll come back to me later but after our one chord here we have a passing tone here in the bass and then we have uh, b flat b flat e flat and f and it's very common to see four three suspensions over five chords sometimes in this cadential context where bach will cadence on the end of the beat or even a beat later depending on what the the rhythmic configuration is but it's a half cadence nonetheless Okay, next phrase ends in an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of G minor, and uh, we start in the key of E flat, and we move to the key of G minor near the end of the phrase. So we start off with a descending chromatic bass line, which is pretty cool. Um, we have B flat, uh, D, F, and B flat, which is uh, B flat major again, it's our five chord, we don't need to reanalyze. And let's see what this descending chromatic bass line has in store for us. We have A natural, we have C, we have F, and we have C, which is F major over A. It's 5, 6 of 5. And then we get A flat. And this is pretty cool how Bach does this. A flat, B flat, F, and D, which is B7 over A flat. 
that's just 5, 4, 2. So the 5 of 5 does resolve to a 5 chord, and that's pretty cool that Bach's able to do that via chromatic movement in the bass. And where do we expect 5, 4, 2 to resolve? To 1, 6, because the 4, 2 chord typically resolves down by step in the bass, and the roots are typically a fifth apart downwards. So 5 to 1, 5, 4, 2 to 1, 6, G, B flat, G, and E flat. 1, 6. We also have some passing tones in the inner voices here where we have G, C, A natural, and E flat, and I don't think that that can really be ignored. We have A uh, minor 7 flat 5 here over G, which uh, would... Hmm, wait, A minor 7 over G would be 7, 4, 2 of 5. 7, 4, 2... Wait, am I doing that right? Yeah, because A is the leading tone to uh, B flat, and B flat is our five. Yes, so here we have seven half diminished for two of five, and we would expect that to go to some five chord, which in the key of E flat major is B flat major. But we would expect seven for two to resolve to three six. Right, so 3, 6 in B flat major terms uh, would be D minor, but instead of getting D minor here, we get uh, B flat major in second inversion. F, uh, D, B flat, and D. So three of the voices are very D minor like, but the B flat throws us for a loop. So this is an example of an irregular 4 2 resolution. Um, but I guess, technically speaking, what really matters here, and uh, uh, this has more so to do with the fact that this is a subdivided chord progression, is the fact that the 7 of 5 resolves to 5. Really, the 4-2 aspect of this is the fact that the inner voices are what are moving, and the bass is, sta is static. Uh, so I take with a grain of salt the fact that this is an irregular 4-2 resolution. This uh, 5 of 4 resolved to something other than 1-6, that would be more of an interesting talking point. But this 7-4-2 of 5 resolving to 5-6-4, um, it's a relatively logical resolution because it still resolves stepwise in the bass, and three of the voices are very D minor-like, it's just the B flat that's different, so it's really just operating as a substitute in that regard. But I do think this is where we're going to the key of G minor, and apologies for the analysis getting a little cramped here, but this is... Um, uh, now our three chord in first inversion, definitely kind of interesting to see five turn into three here, but it, it happens. I don't think this is the first time that I've seen that. But we see melodic minor in the bass here, so we know that a modulation is afoot. We have E natural, G, B flat, and C, which is C7 over E flat. We've seen this progression earlier in the Krell, that's four, six, five. Not a secondary dominant, it's a harm harmonization of melodic minor. We don't have F sharp. D, A, and C, which is 5, 6, 5, D7 over F sharp. Um, like I said, we saw this progression earlier in the corral as well. Um, and then we go to G minor, G, D, G, and B flat, which is our tonic in root position. And to close out our corral, we have a perfect authentic cadence in the key of E flat. And I do think we start off in the key of E flat as well, because G is going to take us to A flat here. Technically a little chromatic bass line here as well, but not really. Um, it's not really a continuous chromatic bass line, because it's uh, bridged by a note that's uh, separated by a phrase. Uh, but we're going to call this G minor chord our three chord in the key of A flat. As, I'm sorry, the key of E flat as well. I was thinking ahead to the fact that I was going to mention that we had our tonic turn into three in terms of A flat earlier in the corral. But uh, three is going to take us to four, A flat, C, E flat, and E flat. Very similar to how we had three go to four in root position. Um, between C and A flat as well. It's also the same relationship of C and A flat and G and E flat, the mediate and the tonic and the mediate and the tonic. So maybe there's some uh, symmetry there, or some likening between these two phrases, who knows? Four is going to take us to five, four, two. Actually, these phrases are quite a bit more similar than um, uh, I give them initial credit for. We have A flat, B flat, D, and F. B flat seven over A flat. And then this is a bit of a seemingly 
a regular resolution here, but we've seen it before in Bach, actually quite a bit before in Bach, where the 5-4-2 chord we would expect to resolve to 1-6, but what happens is the bass moves faster than the harmonic rhythm, so the bass resolves down by step, um, but we don't get the E-flat until the next beat, so it looks like we're going from 5-4-2 to 1, but we have both of the components of a resolution from 5-4-2 to 1-6, because the bass moves and then we get the chord, but they don't happen simultaneously. So is it an irregular resolution? I don't know. I think it's just a contrapuntal resolution, but all the components are there, so I'm inclined to say no, it's not, but I'll leave that up for you to decide. I could see an argument where it is an irregular resolution, depending on how uh, strict of a relationship you have with the harmony. But after our one chord, we have D, B flat, F, and A. It's another five chord. This time it's in first inversion, and there's the seventh, five, seven. We have B flat, we have F, we have D, and we have A, so here technically the chord is uh, turning into root position with the 7th, so 7, 5, 3 there. That takes us to E flat, G, B flat, and G, which is our tonic triad root position. And uh, that briefly takes us to first inversion, where we have uh, G, B flat, E flat, and G. Uh, and then we get ready for our cadence. We have A flat, C, E flat, and F. We know that Bach loves 2-6-5 chords, especially in cadential contexts. Um, a flat is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it. D is a known chord tone. C is a chord tone. That takes us to B flat major, B flat, F, D, and F, which is our 5 chord. B flat's a chord tone. A flat's a little passing 7th. And lastly, we cadence on E flat major, E flat, G, B flat and E flat tonic triad root position, and that is today's relatively longer chorale. I uh, haven't made a video this long in um, definitely a few weeks, if not a couple of months. I definitely lose track of how long these videos have been uh, lasting, but I think the last several videos have been sort of in the 20 to 30 minute range, and this one's going to be pushing 45. But just talking about a couple of the uh, bigger takeaways of this chorale, we have a lot of mid-phrase modulations, and I've been calling them mid-phrase modulations because um, what ends up happening in the average uh, phrase, let's say for example the second phrase of the B section, when Bach modulates, that's typically the key he ends the phrase in. This chorale is not a good example of that, but uh, if you look at Bach's chorales, you'll find that if there's a modulation near the beginning of a phrase, he will end the phrase in that initial modulation, but here we see mid-phrase modulations a bounce, C minor to G minor, uh, then we have, uh, we modulate to E flat, then we modulate back to C minor, and then we modulate to B flat, or we go from uh, E flat to F minor, then to C minor, or we modulate to A flat, then back to E flat minor, and then we, uh, this would not be a mid-phrase modulation, because we end in the phrase that we first modulate to, or we end in the key at the with the first key that we modulate to in the phrase, uh, but the majority of the phrases in this chorale have mid-phrase modulations in them, which is pretty cool. It's definitely a unique thing about this particular chorale. We see lots of instances of our tonic operating as the dominant of four as well. Five, four, two of four over here. Five, potentially five, four, two of four over here as well. And I feel like there are more instances here. It might be crazy, or it might be just because I was talking about them a lot, it seemed like more than what, uh, maybe I'm making it out the seam, but we do have some instances of our tonic operating as 5 of 4 as well. We also have what I think is the most interesting part of the chorale here is a tonicization of 7, or this uh, 2 slash 7 ambiguity, as I call it. It's situations like these that make it really difficult to uh, really discern what Bach's going for with these 2 slash 7 chords that pop up all the time in his music. But um, yeah, it's, in it's it's very interesting to see a tonicization of 2 and then 2 morph into 7. It's almost like 7 is being tonicized by 7 of 2. And I think that that's a really interesting little uh, quirk about this particular chorale. But all the chromatic density in this chorale, oh, and of course there are chromatic bass lines in this chorale. We have a descending chromatic bass line. We have a uh, uh, regular chromatic bass line as well, I think. I remember seeing a regular chromatic bass line somewhere. That might be crazy. Uh, am I crazy? Maybe. I, maybe I am. Maybe I'm just uh, confusing the fact that we had these little um, 
half-step passages going on here in the bass and also later in the chorale as well. But regardless, we do have a descending chromatic bass line, which is pretty neat, and it's really awesome that Bach is able to keep a um, functionally harmonic uh, progression going across the, uh, the bass line. And that's pretty much all the takeaways uh, that I wanted to talk about this uh, about this particular uh, chorale, so I'm going to cap the video off on those thoughts. If you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel. You can hit the notification icon and like the uh, video if you enjoy the content as well. Thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.